Welcome to the Everything is a Primary Source podcast. I'm your host, Eric Paul. Today's episode starts about bacon and eggs, but ends up as a conversation about industry and infrastructure. You'll have to listen to see how it gets there. I was so glad to be joined by two fellow social studies teachers turned podcasters. The two Phils of Canada J. Harry High School in New York, co-hosts of the Missing Chapter podcast. We chatted about the famous beech nut plant in their town along the Erie Canal and New York State Thruway. Take a listen. So this has been just a wonderful meet and greet with Phil and Phil at the National Council for the Social Studies. This is the exact kind of thing I was envisioning when I signed up for this uh, months ago. And you're presenting later today about your podcast. And uh, tell us a little bit about that, because I, I think our origin story is very similar as far as where we came up with this Yeah, stuff. Eric, this has been fantastic. Uh, Phil and I have our own podcast. It's called The Missing Chapter Podcast. It uh, kind of centers around obscure, unknown stories from, from history. And um, it was funny, when we when we met you, we had the the upstate New York connection. Yeah. Um, but our town is very small. Canajahari, New York. Not many people have heard of it. But we mentioned Beech Nut, yeah. the factory that, that you know, was in Canajahari for so long. And immediately, that connection you know, became even stronger. Because it is literally a milestone whenever I'm traveling from east to west or back again, um, from Albany to Rochester, where mm-hmm. my in-laws live, of, like, when I see the Beech Nut Factory, or what's left of it, unfortunately, I'm like, oh, okay, I know how much more to gauge the distance. And um, Phil, other Phil, uh, I, I think it's funny how... We're both doing the same kind of thing. It came from the same place as far as... But isn't it interesting that, despite how high-tech that is, the way that podcasters find each other is the most basic form of human interaction? Absolutely. There's a lost art in civil discourse, uh, having eye contact with people, shaking hands, and we need to bring that back. And I think the use of technology is great um, if it's used to enhance that right. personal connection. And that's what we're doing right now. And I, I, I encourage all of your students and, and everybody that you've worked with to continue that because that's a process that should never become a lost art. We, we need to put everything in its proper place, like as far as these new exciting tools like AI, and I say exciting air quotes, um, into its proper role. But the conversation should never be limited. We shouldn't compartmentalize that. This is what we're all about. And you're absolutely right. I mean, since the dawn of man, it was oral history that brought us together. And even though technology expands, it should still be oral history that continues to bring us together as opposed to divide us even more. Exactly. And speaking of, I'm going to try my best to bring this line of reasoning into what we're going to talk about. And that would be breakfast. Yes. And baby food. Um, it's funny because over your shoulder, Phil, is Jamestown settlement and a depiction of a woman in colonial garb showing a little girl the handicrafts. And um, it's like that world of everything being homespun, homemade. Every you know the the processing was done in the house. Rapidly disappeared, starting with the market revolution. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that man-made waterway that runs through Canada Jihari and is probably the reason it exists, the Erie Canal, was a major purveyor of that market revolution. So then you go 100 years outside of that, and we have this process of bringing food to table and even to nourish our babies all kind of like presented to us and after a while nobody even questions it but what is the story what how do we get because you mentioned before we hit record some pretty yeah cool. right before so before we were we were on air i was telling eric um about the story of kenny jerry so one, one of the one of the issues right now is the fact that beach Nut has since moved um to amsterdam new york and you know very high-tech facility and we're excited for beach Nut, that that company however it has a it's had a pretty negative impact on the kenny jerry community itself um but, and, and we're still proud of our community. We, we, up until a few months ago, before it got hit by a tractor trailer, we were one of the only uh, towns that still had a dummy light. Oh. You know, which is kind of old Americana, right? Yeah. So, but one of, our, one of our stories we always tell our kids 
um, because a lot of our kids don't even know the history of Kennedy Harry because they've grown up in, in sort of that, that downtrodden area mm -hmm. after Beachnut has left. So unfortunately, they, they know nothing differently. But yeah. our parents um, who, who remember presidents coming through and, and, and flourishing, you always wanted to go to Kennedy Harry because that was like the upper echelon of the, of the Mohawk Valley. Mm -hmm. um, one of our uh, pieces of history that, we, that we're proud of is the fact that the whole origin, we talk about origins here, of having a large breakfast with bacon and eggs comes directly from <laughs> Kennedy Harry, New York. And the story is pretty cool. Uh, the story goes that uh, the sale of bacon at Beechnut was was on a downslide. Mm -hmm. It was decreasing rapidly. So like, what do we do? You know, we're, we have all these people hired, we're losing tons of money. How do we make bacon sales go up? So what they ended up doing is they hired a marketing director, um, which uh, his name escapes my mind right now. But what he ended up doing was he called 10 doctors and said, hey, would, would having a big breakfast or no breakfast be better? They said, oh, big breakfast. <laughs> and nine out of 10 doctors did that. So he ended up marketing that in magazines all over and saying, hey, you, you pair eggs and bacon. Uh, it says a big bre nine out of 10 doctors say yeah. a big breakfast is much better than no breakfast at all. And, and it, the rest is And history. it was all from Beach Nut saying, what do yes. we do with the surplus bacon? Correct. Right. And if you actually, if you Google um, the origins of breakfast, uh, bacon and eggs, mm -hmm. having bacon for breakfast, it'll go right back to Beach Nut, and it's all over now. Uh, I know, I, I can't remember if it was the History Channel or the Science History Channel, Channel. Did, did an episode, um, Food That Built, Made America, mm -hmm. I think was on it too, right. uh, that talks about the origins of that. And gets its credibility that way, right. and it, it's, I, we, I just want to talk about that for just a moment, because that's such an interesting series mm -hmm. that, you know, because History Channel has done lots of, you know, just did you know? Did you know? Kind of stuff. And that I was talking just earlier with a woman about the uh, Super Size Me oh, yeah. documentary from 2004 and how there was like an awareness, I think, around 20 years ago about food and putting it into our, you know, what we in ingest and, and digest and all that stuff. And now it's like, Okay, so where did all that start? Like, when did we get this? You know, because it's, you know, if nothing else, gastronomic history is just interesting. And um, it, on the one hand, it's like, well, that's totally random. It seems like it could be anywhere, but, but actually not, because the Erie Canal, my obsession, my, <laughs> my everything, um, is it cuts through a very rural, agrarian swath of land in New York State. When people hear New York, they tend to think big city. But it's it's not, and so you know this canal connected rural areas with the rest of the world, with the rest of the country first, but then the rest of the world, and so a farmer who's raising eggs and hogs for bacon now has this like huge national outlet by way of beech nut and marketing. And then this canal, which even if it wasn't used by that, what, what time period are we talking about as far as getting that message of? Uh, as far as the bacon message? Yeah. That, I think it was early, early 20th century, if I'm, okay. if I'm remembering so it's correctly. I could be wrong. But probably alongside with like these things being published. Yes. You know, and yep. it, it's funny because like that ethos, pathos, logos, you know, meant, like that marketing right. to, tool thing. Um, I have a whole bunch of these old... Saturday Evening Post and Life magazines, and like half of them on the backside are cigarette ads. And from that same time period, it's always like doctors, you know, like smoking a cigarette in the picture, like they recommend, you know, this for their T zone, like health. And, and Eric, I got a great story to, to tie that all together. So, you know, Beach Nut in their, in their heyday would sell anything from bubble gum to apple juice to baby food, which was probably what they were most known yeah. for, to chewing tobacco. And I, you think, well, how does that fit into all of that? And uh, I was in Cooperstown one day, and I happened to bump into former third baseman for the New York Yankees, Cleet Boyer. <laughs> and I said, you know, as we were talking, and he said, where are you from? And I said, Canada Jahari. And he knew in, immediately where it was because he said to me, he said, that's the, the chewing tobacco I used when I was in the major oh, leagues. Wow. Canada Jahari, beech nut, chewing tobacco. But it's interesting because you talk about rural America. The majority of our students are farmers. Mm -hmm. And they're... they're practices in, in how, how they raise chickens, raise hogs, the, the manner in which they're trying to turn organic and you know treat their animals much more humanitarian, they're leading the way again in that. So it's, it is, it's interesting how food production in upstate New York 
whether it's the Erie Canal and now the New York State Thruway, yeah. we seem to be right at the epicenter of all of that. And, it, it, you know, so it's like that's going to literally feed the country. And you want your, you want your doing proper. You want it, right. you know, I, I think we, we, we should celebrate as much as possible the contributions of the, because this country used to be mostly farms. Mm-hmm. You know, it was an agricultural empire as Thomas Jefferson envisioned it to be, you know, for a long time. And really up until right around that time that we're talking about, early 20th century is when the mechanization really started to take effect and everything like that. Um, so, I, I mean, we've already danced around this question anyway. The material this is made from is, and, you know, it's not like a, a hard and fast, you know, like this is a movie or a TV show, mm-hmm. but the, the facility that we're referring to that for a very long time it had the giant sign. Yes. That you could see for miles. Like you'd come up over the, the, the hill on the road and you would see Beech Nut. And you, it, it's not like other facilities that they don't usually put, they don't put a sign on it necessarily because like they don't care if you know what's being made in there. But, but that signage, um, what, what's behind the sign there for? I mean, we've already kind of discussed a little bit, but Beech Nut as a yeah, entity. And, and we're 45 minutes you know, down, down the road from GE, from mm-hmm. General Electric, who also has a massive sign. And that's, you know, having grown up in Canada, Harry, that's what that always made me think of. We have like a GE sort of you know, element to that. And you're right, it was something that we were proud of. You take a physical building of mortar and brick and stone and that sign, that's what people knew us for. And we were proud of that. And and really for the longest time, Canna Jerry kind of epitomized the factory being the hub in the center of the community. That's where people worked. Mm-hmm. That's the money and the revenue that came in and, and supported our town. Um, and it was our identity. And I think that's why people in our area are really struggling, Phil, with, yes, it's it's old, it's decrepit, it's, it's literally falling apart but we're struggling with seeing it come down. Yeah, and it's it, it, being part of any sort of history, whether it's familial history, uh, you know, township community history, it's, it's, it's sad to see anything go downhill. And I think, you know, you, you mentioned your obsession with, with the Erie Canal and what that <laughs> provided, and I, I totally agree with you. I think if, you know, a lot of people have called the, the New York State Thruway um, the 21st century Erie Canal, yeah. and I would have to respectfully disagree because the Erie Canal brought communities together where I feel like, Unfortunately, this this actually was sparked by my dad. He had this idea that he believed, you know, he grew up in St. Johnsville um, and he, he played with all these different basketball teams and, and, and played with Syracuse. And so he's, he's kind of well known around our local communities. And he always said that these communities were so closely knit mm-hmm. up until the thruway when people would go past the right. villages, not through them. So, you know, with the Erie Canal, you would stop. You would you would uh, need the help from local villagers. You would you would interact with everybody, having that civil discourse that we started this episode with. Yeah. And now here we are with the throughway, and everyone's just hey, we want to get through New York State as fast as possible without stopping. And if you need to stop, there's rest stops right. for you. You those, don't have to stop. Those in the rest villages. areas are not the right. town. It's Correct. just Dunkin' Donuts and all the chain places, and you, they all look identical to each other. Correct. And especially they're going to even more because last time I was on the throughway, there's they're. Um, doing rehab on like half of them if not all yeah. of them and they're all going to look like shoe boxes right. and just the, the, don't get me started on those rest stops they are not as welcoming as they were just 10 years ago as far as like wide open spaces but you know all of this um, you're absolutely right about it so the, the Erie Canal is known as the mother of cities not just in New York but pretty much every like the, all the way out to Chicago Milwaukee they you know and even New York City was built into the massive because of the canal and all the commerce going back and forth on it. Uh, and when the throughway was conceived, uh, it even predates the interstates. So, you know, the Thomas E. Dewey, it was, like you said, idea was to go along with, and also the, the railroad that came before it, the DeWitt Clinton, uh, you know, shadowed the, the canal that, you know, they, they named the first train after the governor who made the canal. And so they're all like right next to each other, but it's the speed of each one, the pace of each one, that makes them that dramatically different. Because you're absolutely right about that. You can go on a full tank of gas from Albany all the way to Buffalo, 
and not have to stop at all. There's right. no reason to. And so you bypass a lot of these places that even in the, the U.S. Route 20 era, U.S. Route 20 used to have a lot more stuff yeah, on it. Right. You know, little right. the roadside attractions. This isn't not far from Kinnajahari. Isn't there like a giant teepee? Um, yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's. I actually. I. It's funny because I. I drive Route 20, parts of it, in order to get to work. Uh, but the teepee's right outside. It's not too far from Cooperstown. Um, and it's. It's just interesting to have this conversation because. You know, the next chapter for Kanajahari is going to be an interesting one. Because yeah. as Beechnut comes down, it's being replaced by a lab that will be, you know, you talk about the changing times, um, that, that will be doing the cultivation and working with marijuana, whether mm. it be medicinal or recreational. And, and the, the lab is, um, is putting a ton of money into our community. So it's, there's a lot of optimism there, a lot of cautious optimism yeah. jointly with... God, no pun intended. I can't believe this. Oh, jeez. Uh, that was unintentional. Um, but with the loss of Beach Nut, the official loss. Mm. Lo Beach Nut went away years and years ago, but the building was still there. And I think, you know, that was, that's was that been hard. But, you know, new days are ahead for Canada Jahari. Yeah. Uh, we're fortunate enough with the throughway that we do have an exit. And that sounds kind of silly, but people no. can get off. And it's like that's that's a big part of, I think, why Canada Jahari was... Um, was attractive for this next project. Mm -hmm. So the money coming in while other towns are still kind of rapidly declining, that optimism's growing, which is, it's encouraging as teachers who work with the students, who have the parents in this community, we're, we're excited about it. One of the things that I think uh, can contribute to the longevity or like the hope for the future of the physical structures is when they originally went up and how appealing and attractive, or even in what state of repair they're still mm -hmm. in. And I think about the community I teach in, Dover, New Hampshire. Um, it's, a, it's one of the oldest continuously lived in communities. They just celebrated 400 years this wow. year. Um, and they, they call themselves the seventh settlement. It's the seventh oldest community in the country, continuously lived in. But it's real birth was not 1623 its real birth was about 200 years later when the mills the textile mills started being built and so they're one of the original american industrial revolution cities and so the the mills are these beautiful brick structures very 19th century look to them they were in operation as mills until the 20th century and um they went unused as mills for a little while, but now there's apartments in there, there's um, businesses of all different types, everything from uh, a pasta manufacturer to computer, a lot of artisans use the spaces, and it has that nice appeal inside and out of like the worn bricks and the nice beams overhead. And unfortunately, 20th century architecture especially like mid 20th century, doesn't have that same appeal. Um, I follow an Instagram account, and actually he's been on my podcast just recently, uh, called Recycled Architecture. And it focuses on things like Dunkin' Donuts that have turned into other, you know, like, uh, and I think Pizza Hut's like the number one. Like you see like, <laughs> oh, there's a Pizza Hut and now it's a bank. Or there's a Pizza Hut and now it's a, you know, doctor's office or something yeah. like that. It's in Canada Harry right now. Yes. We have an old one. Yeah, and an old Pizza Hut that's, yep. that's now something else. And Well, yeah. take a picture and send it to him because he'll post it on Instagram and it's we'll just do. a fun little thing. But it's like the recyclability of some of these more modern structures. Like, again, it goes back to the roadways. So they built these recognizable buildings like Howard Johnson's with garish colors and Holiday Inn with its great sign that to catch people's eye from the road. Mm -hmm. You know, Denny's sign peeking yeah. up over the throughway. Yeah. Oh, there, well, after that goes out of business, there's only so much you can do with it. And I'm thinking like the beach nut facility probably has like a hundred years of asbestos like in that was it. The so big problem. Like, we that was can't the big problem. do anything with this now. Yeah. Well, if you if you go down the throughway uh, headed east, only a few miles and you hit the Fonda exit, yeah. you'll notice one of the largest uh, McDonald's signs you've probably ever seen. 
it's just it's skies yeah. it, and we always wondered like why why did you need it that high you could just you know you, yeah. you didn't need it to have that i mean you could see it from the road you could see it from space almost <laughs> the but, astronauts um, were like oh there's fonda <laughs> you know i do want to point something out too as you were talking and, and you always mention this to our students to, to to remember all this local history and to be proud of where you live and you know we have we have uh, the susan b anthony story where mm -hmm. you know she taught at west hill um, in Ken and Jaharian. We also have a local connection. You mentioned Schenectady, mm -hmm. and I don't want to take your, steal your thunder, so I'm going to give him credit for this, all right? Okay. So Phil Horner, not Phil Schaff, gets credit for this. Thanks, Phil. Um, no problem. <laughs> but uh, he always tells our students that Schenectady, New York, one of the things that, that was, uh, you know, the origin of, that they take credit for, is the first street light. You know, so the first oh, street lights in America yeah. came from that GE plant in Schenectady, in New York. So there's oh, all these little nuggets that a lot of people have, Maybe don't yeah. know. No, you know and, and we need and, to share these. And you make a good point because you know, understanding history, people tend to think of the the more conventional. Here's your textbook, you yeah. know, learn the names, but it's it's not. And and this is what makes podcasting great. You're bringing stories that are more obscure, but local stories that make you appreciate your everyday life, mm -hmm. the everyday town that you you grow frustrated with at times or bored with at times. It's got that story that you're now a part of, and I think that's a beautiful thing. It's a place-based history. Yes. Can sometimes be mis... I don't want to say misused, but like just represented like, did you know that that was where I... You know, good. Yeah. Done. But it's like, if you start there, that's your foundation, and then do what we're talking about right now, like extending that and be like, okay, so... Tell me how important an electric streetlight is yeah. to, like, what what are some of the, like, an exercise I've done before in classes, like, put, like, the light bulb up and say, all right, what's everything that has happened because of this? You know, everything from, well, safety at night for drivers and pedestrians, the streetlights have helped that. It, it beautifies the city, you know, makes people feel more welcome. I mean, it has just, like, so many great effects afterwards that, and to say, well, it started here, and not randomly, by the way. This is like there's a reason behind it, and if we study the history of this, you can apply that to really anywhere, and just get this fuller, more enriched version of just life. Because that's isn't that why we're here is to Precisely. to take yes. it all in and not just you yeah, know see it well through put. a lens yeah. all the time. Um, I think this is just phenomenal. I'm so glad that we we had this opportunity. Oh, there was one other thing I wanted to bring up too. You mentioned Fonda because that's the shrine. Uh, Interior tech with it, yes. yeah. And I yeah. just, my my wife and I, you know, we traveled the throughway all the time because her family's in Rochester, and uh, this this summer in particular because our son is old enough that he um, has stayed with his grandparents for like extended mm -hmm. uh, weeks actually, and so we over the summer we're going back and forth quite a bit, and we finally stopped at that shrine because we hadn't done it before, and I was interested mostly in the. You know, because I know her story dates back to the 17th century, but like, when did the shrine go in? And is there any question. incidents as far as the? And so I saw, I was tracking it, and it's like U.S. Route 20. It's on Route 20, so it's like it was part of that roadside attraction component, mm. and it is a roadside attraction. Because as you're driving down that road, you can't help but see the chapel, the Stations of the Cross mm -hmm. along the outside. And then it invites you into a museum. The museum itself is very, it's like 1950s looking. Mm -hmm. They haven't updated it since then very much, which is fine. It's its own frozen in time aspect of it. And it's like, but it's it's really only attended by locals now because of the throughway. Right. You know, because I-90 has taken it over. And it's just like, all right, now if you're, and that's right, we, we've never gone to it. It's just like, you know, there, there, there's uh, all right, we'll, we'll get it on the way back, and then we you know, or, or same thing with um, uh, I, there's so many C, you know, the one with uh, L. Frank Baum's birthplace, um, oh, well, Frank, that's, yeah, that's near, near Syracuse. Syracuse. Um, a, uh, Canada, we talked about not Canada, not Canada, 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 it's um, Chittenango, 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 Chittenango. Oh, yes. or Chittenango. Yeah, we, got there. Yeah, um, yeah. we stopped there the summer too because they have a all things Oz yes. museum, but unfortunately they're only open like three days a week. And Chittenango is and they have the yellow brick road sidewalks, but it's, but, but it's, it's got to be accessible. It's sad, it's you know. Be, it's yeah. not yeah. where it was, right, right. you know, before, and it's like the throughway did a lot of great things of removing traffic from. You know the the two lane roads and 
allowing for, I mean, there's so many 18 wheelers is going back and forth and it allows for all that to happen, but the cost is a cultural one. We get, we lose that local, you know, because why should your students, you know, feel any kind of real local pride if they're like, well, we're just part of New York, we're just part of right. the United States, it's like one big monolithic thing, so. I'm so glad we got to do this. This was great. This is Thank you so much. Exactly you. why yeah. I came here. So awesome. This, this is, is why we do a podcast. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So this so. is great. And, and I, I have a feeling we're going to be doing more yeah. joint work in the, I, I, in the almost future. It's, everybody I've talked to today, yep. in this the last two days, I'm like, I hope this is not the last time we talk. I hope Absolutely. this becomes a common thing, and I'm looking forward to it. Phil and Phil, and just one more time, the name of your podcast for everybody. It's the Missing Chapter Podcast. Uh, it's available on Spotify, Anchor. Uh, wherever major podcasts uh, are provided. Good. Excellent. Thank and you very much. Do you have a website and stuff? Or is yeah, themissingchapterpodcast.com, and you can also reach us at themissingchapterpodcast at gmail.com also. And and you guys are really willing to talk about anything, right? It's not just it's New all York State. It's, yeah. it's any, all any kind of yeah. out yep. there stuff. So, Or, you know, things that are not usually covered in a regular Correct. survey yep. of, of yep. history. Yep. Excellent. Thank you so much awesome. for joining Thank us. Thank you, Eric. If you agree with the three of us that there's more to history than what you can read in textbooks, and that conversation is the key to learning, then do I have exciting news for you. The Everything is a Primary Source project will turn things over to teachers and their students to help create a living, online educational resource. Short discussions with people reacting to pop culture artifacts, like the one you just heard, which are products of the live exhibits I conduct, will be the basis of each of the entries into the interactive digital resource. But humanities instructors, librarians, and their classes and clubs will be able to submit their own views on subjects, helping to create a vital, reliable secondary source to help others learn history through pop culture. Be sure to go to everything-history.com to learn more.